Vlad is a hero in my family, and I look to him that way, and it's my honor to introduce him and let him uh, spend some time speaking to us from the Word. I may have an accident I usually do anymore when I'm in the pulpit with water. <clears throat> I may have an accident not because of me, but because I have an Auburn fan introducing me, and I have a Florida fan controlling me in the back. So I have no hope this morning without being sabotaged. I want you to know that I bring great love and greetings to all of you from Mary and from Maria, but also, uh, if Steve were still living, I'd also bring you love from Steve and Mark and Tanya, who have very fun memories of coming to the old building quite frequently, as often as we were in the States reporting. I also want you to know that I always have you in my thoughts and prayers, and I know that you always have uh, our family in your thoughts and in your prayers. We always think of Palm Beach Lakes as being our family. And we hope and pray that you feel the same way toward our family. And when I come, it is a little bit somewhat like speaking sometime to your own children or your own grandchildren, your own family. It's sort of a little bit like that until I get in the pulpit and then I begin to feel very comfortable with it. I also want you to know that God is blessing, and I can't go past saying this, the work that we do for the Lord in the Pacific together with you. And without you, we would not be able to do that work. By your prayers and by your standing by the su supply line, and just by you being involved directly in the work that we do for the Lord. We deeply appreciate that very much. If I ever needed to go to another congregation in our entire brotherhood that would oversee our work, they, although the elders might not have me, I, I would, number one, turn to Palm Beach Lakes. If something happened to Forest Park, it is hard to leave where you have been for 35 years and overseen by that or sponsored by that congregation. So we love you, we esteem you, and we appreciate you, and you're forever in our, in our prayers. I have enjoyed very much this lectureship, and having the opportunity to be able to sit and listen, and to have my battery charged. Because as a missionary on the field, working in many countries now in the Pacific and how for many years, I'm always draining my battery and, and recharging other batteries. So this has been a great lectureship in my having the opportunity to have my battery recharged. But the reason that we're here today and here at this time it's talking about working out our own salvation. You and I working out our salvation. And certainly the text, Philippians 2 and verses 12 to 16, highlights that very point. The word work means to be active, to energize. And you know, usually we just think about, we just think about that word work means that I've got to work, I've got to be active. But if you look at the full extension of, the, of this word, it not only means to be active and to energize, but it also means to finish the task. The phrase your own would mean that it is a personal responsibility that every Christian who is a born-again believer has. I cannot do it for you, you cannot do it for me. And if I could hold on to the, the skirt of one person, and that would carry me to heaven, believe me, I would do it. The word salvation means deliverance, to be saved for the saving of the soul. Isn't that what all of Christianity is about? 
from the time that we're baptized until the time that we leave this world, what it's all about is our deliverance and our being saved and our salvation. Now, the question is, based on Philippians chapter 2 and verse verse 12 and 13, how can we work out our own salvation? I'd like to suggest to you that there are four ways that you and I as Christians can work out our own salvation. Number one, we can work it out with fear and trembling. When we look at the book of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, our text, Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Going all the way back to the very beginning of God revealing His Word in the Pentateuch, we would see this stated in Deuteronomy 6 and in verse 2. Here, God would say that you may fear the Lord, your God, to keep His statutes and His commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your your days may be prolonged. You see, Moses set before God's people a very, very important command. And here's a principle that we find back in the Pentateuch that would never change. Patriarchal age, Mosaical age, the Christian age, it does not change. Here is the instruction that every redeemed of God in any age must remember. That is that the children of God, God's redeemed of every age, must be people that will be reverent toward God. They will have that awesome respect that is based upon love toward God. You know, when I was was a young man, very young man, and I I think I got old enough that my dad knew I I understood He sat me down and he he talked to me and he said, Robert, here's what you can do. You can obey me because, he said, you can obey me because the worst scenario is this. I'm going to lay the leather to your backside. (laughs) Or you you can love me and respect me and do what I say. Now, after going through a learning process... I, I, then, I, I then became a believer that I needed to take, and I knew he started with the worst scenario, and that I chose to take the second one, and that is to love him and have that awesome respect for Almighty God. In Psalms 99 and verses 1 to 3, the Lord reigns. You know, not only is Jesus reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords, But Jehovah reigns as king of all. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion. And he is high above all the people. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. You see, because of who God is, because Jehovah is sitting on his throne, And because we know who He is, we know what He's done, we need to have that love and awesome respect for God. And because of that, we will fear God. We'll really fear God because we love Him and respect Him so much. Now in Ecclesiastes 12, in verses 13 and 14, the conclusion of the writing by Solomon as God through the Holy Spirit instructed him, Solomon wrote these words. After he had more or less discovered or tried or went through life and many things had come across his pathway, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God 
and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including the secret things, whether they be good or whether they be evil. You know, I like to say it this way. Here's the bottom line. I mean, there is no more. We must fear God. That is how that awesome respect that is based upon great love for God, and this will lead us to obey Him. You know, I had two choices, right? I had two choices. Listen to my Father or suffer the consequences of a leather strap. Now, I knew that leather strap. Young people, it was not abuse. I only took that a few times. And I learned that it wasn't abuse, it was great love. And my father always sat me down and told me that before I got it. But then I, lear- I also learned that there was a better option that I had. That is to have this awesome love and respect for my father. And this would lead me to obey. Look at verse Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, and here is that coordinating conjunction and. It's tied to keeping His commandments. You know, we will not question God. We will simply obey God if we fear God. What does it mean to fear God? To have that love, (coughs) excuse me, to have that love (coughs) and awesome respect for Jehovah God. Because He is the King of all and He is sitting on His throne. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, the Hebrew writer would say, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence, there it is, and godly fear, for our God is a Our God is a consuming God. You know, if we fear God, we have that awesome respect and and love for God. Maybe I should say that awesome love and respect for God. Then you see, we will do that which is acceptable in His sight. We will not question God. I always enjoyed my children questioning me One time we were traveling on a a flight from Honolulu back to L.A. because there were no direct flights into Atlanta in those days. And between Honolulu and Hawaii, I believe that Steve and Mark must have asked me, Steve and Mark must have asked me a million questions. And finally the person sitting behind me said, leaning over, Mr., you have the most inquisitive children in the whole world. They have not stopped asking questions. Well, what reminded me of that is when Greg and I were flying from from Atlanta and there was a little boy sitting behind me and everything that happened from the time we left the terminal taxied out and all the way until he fell asleep, then he had questions for his mother who was sitting next to him. But this is a different situation with God. God has given us all the answers we need. And when God speaks, brethren, I'm telling you literally, that settles it. And we do not have the right to question Almighty God. And if we fear God, have that reverence and awesome love and respect for God, we will not do that. And then the second way that we may be able to work out our own salvation, or we can. It's all in the text. All the, I love textual lessons. It's all found in Philippians 2, verses 12 to verse 16. The second thing that we can do is to do all things without murmuring and disputing. Now, we have a problem with this. And the reason that we have a problem with this it is simply because we are an inquisitive people. That, that is good in many ways. But in many other ways, it can be a, a problem. Philippians 2 and 14. 
Paul would say, do all things without complaining and murmuring. Do all things without complaining and murmuring. How many of us are guilty of just that? I mean, whether it be God's word and a command or a principle or an example that is binding, whatever it is, have you ever caught yourself just complaining and just murmuring about it, disputing about it? And especially if it comes down to the elders making a decision and the elders make that decision, I'm telling you it just starts, doesn't it? And no matter what the decision is, whether it's a right and a, a, and a left, or whether it is a back or forward, whatever it may be, you just know, am I right? Am I being realistic? It is going to start. And you know it's going to start. You know, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves in this area. The word complaining Really means, a, really means a murmur, a murmuring. And listen to this, it means a muttering. You know, I always know when Mary is upset with me. I know that. I know, well, oh, I usually know it when I said it. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I knew it, or when I did it. I know when she is upset, and especially when she goes away and... I know, I know I'm telling you that I am in deep trouble. I know that. And so I just, if I'm back in the States, I just sit back in my recliner and don't talk. Because there needs to be a relaxing of the situation. Now, I didn't say I always did that, okay? But I am telling you. To murmur or to mutter or grumble is to say anything against in a low tone as I just illustrated. It is really, and I love this, the original Greek word or sometimes phrase would be a, a, like a cooing of, a, of doves or pigeons. The, <laughs> this is not good. This is not good. But in 1 Corinthians 10, <laughs> in verse 10 to 12, listen to what Paul would say. He gave us a great illustration in the verses before verse 10 to 12. He says, nor complain, remember that's mutter, muttering, mumbling, in a low tone against something. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. It is very destructive to ourselves and to others and to the church when this goes on. Now, Paul will go on to say, now all these things happen to us as examples. And he said, you know what you need to do? You need to take heed lest you fall. You know, when people start the murmuring and the muttering and the grumbling, brethren, I'm telling you, it is dangerous for them. It is dangerous for others. And it is very hurtful and harmful to all that may be involved. Jesus also told his disciples in John 6, 43, do not murmur among yourselves. Can you hear them? They're just over here talking to themselves. And Jesus said, don't do it. It's bad for you. It's bad for others. And I tell you, brethren, it's bad for the church. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9, Peter will say, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Have you ever stayed with someone and you just got the feeling when you leave, they're going to say, I wish I didn't have to keep you. <laughs> Are they going to go in somebody else and say, you know that person, they got the awfulest habit, and, but they're going to do it like this. Where are going to people? And then it's going to spread. You see, Jesus said to his own disciples, do not murmur, or be like a cooing bunch of doves or pigeons. You know, I can't stand pigeons. When I was a young boy growing up, I think I nearly exterminated all the doves and pigeons in our hometown in North Alabama because they are obnoxious. And they just, whoo, whoo. And they make that, and that's all they do. You get them on, you start throwing out the peanuts or the, hopefully they'll choke to death. 
But, but just think about it. They, they will do it and they will not stop. Am I right? Now Jesus said in John 6, 43 to his disciples, do not be like a bunch of cooing pigeons because it's going to be hurtful to you and it's going to be hurtful to others and it's going to be hurtful to the church. You know, many years ago, I was doing a little bit of complaining to an individual in the church. And I was saying certain things. Well, the person was very nice and very kind to me. And they let me just spill my guts. I don't mean my inside, my guts. And they let me stick my foot like that in my mouth. And then they said, that's our uncle. (laughs) Now... (laughs) I tell you, my face must have turned a thousand different shades of red. And I was on the road to apologize and beg forgiveness. You know, have you ever done that? You know, we need to be very careful in this area. Because it will hurt us. It will hurt the elders. It will hurt the deacons. It will hurt, it will hurt the preachers. And most of all... It's going to be very destructive to the church. Don't you think? What good does it come out of being a bunch of obnoxious people? Like a bunch of obnoxious pigeons. And have you ever, have you noticed some people are just that way, aren't they? The elders make a decision and they cannot hardly wait to get outside. Because here the cooing starts. And it cooing starts, and then you know another danger in it. Does it spread? Have you ever got caught up in it? Have you ever got caught up in it? Unintentional, maybe we would even get caught up in such a thing. Oh, well, I've been guilty of it, and I'm sure that most of us have. Brethren, Paul would say, we need to take heed in 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 12, lest we fall. You know what the destroyer desires to do? His desire is is to destroy us as a child of God. And one of the ways he will do it is by murmuring and complaining. By murmuring and complaining. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 4, Paul would say to Timothy, He is proud knowing, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy and strife and all these bad things that should not come to the child of God. You know, once it starts, it grows and it develops. And then the third way that we can work out our own salvation. And brethren, this is something that we have to work at. Something that we have to work on every single day of our life as a child of God. The third thing we need to do to work out our own salvation is by shining as lights in the world. You know, this seems to me, but then I stop and think, and I say to myself, this was not always the case in my life, and so I know that this is an area that we must grow in. Each one of us need to examine ourselves. We need to look at ourselves and we need to say, think about Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless, the children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or generation, among whom you shine as lights. Think about the world we live in. Am I right? Think about how crooked and perverse it is. Think about the world we live in. How evil and terrible. Pick up the newspaper. Turn on the TV. Get on those raspberries you carry around all the time. (laughs) You know, know, and and I've tried to use them and they made me have arthritis in the the thumb so I stopped. You know, get on those things. And don't you see that we live in a crooked and perverse nation? Am I right, brethren? Do we do that? Yes, but he says you can shine as lights in this crooked and perverse nation. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, 
Oh, how Daniel and some of those princesses that went into Babylon, how they did this in that faraway land. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of a firmament. And those who turn may many to righteousness like the stars for it. Brethren, we need to shine for the Lord. Sometimes we don't have to say anything. It's maybe sometimes what we don't say or the way we don't act. That others see Jesus and the beauty of Jesus in us. You know, if we are wise, if we're wise as children of God, we will shine like the brightness of the firmament. I love to be in the South Pacific because south of the equator and where there are not so many street lights and floodlights of all description, you can just look across at night at what God created and it lights up the sky and the earth in which He created. So you and I can shine as lights. And then you know Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. You're the light of the world. Many years ago when the children were growing up in Fiji in those early years, and even as they got older and we would drive all the way around on the western side of the big island Vitilevu that we lived on, we'd drive all the way around to Nandi and Laitoka and Ba and around to Raki Raki in that area. Then we headed back after a day's work or a day or two or three or four or five days of work. We would head back home towards Suva, Fiji. You always knew that when you came up on a large hill about Nauvoo, which you do not know about, but I would like for you to go sometime and see it and to be a part of the work. Just sign up. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. You can just sign up, okay? I'll take the whole congregation. That didn't say I'd pay you way. But you may see Nauvoo, and when you reach the crest of that large hill, it's really a mountain, you can see Suva lit up in the background. And the children were always, would always say, Mom and Dad. I don't know why they always say Mom and Dad, Jonathan. They always say Mom and Dad. Now, that's good. I like it. They would always say, Mom and Dad, we're just about home. Those lights served as a beacon to indicate to them that we were just about home. And then Jesus would say, Let your light shine before men. Here's the reason that we may glorify the Father which is in heaven. You know, isn't it a wonderful privilege that we have to shine as lights in the crooked and perverse nation? In a, in a nation, in a world that is in the darkness of sin, that because we shine as lights by walking in the light as He's in the light, you know, we shine as lights, and that light dispels the darkness. Children love a nightlight. One thing I'm discovering, older people love a nightlight, but for, well, no, same reason. So we may not bump into the wall or stumble over something. But you see, light dispels darkness and is very good. Jesus would say, in, or Paul would say in Ephesians 5 and verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you're the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And when we're walking as children of light, again, we dispel that. Think about the power and influence that we have within us through Jehovah God and His Son, Jesus Christ. We can dispel darkness. You know, I walked into a group of governmental officials. And when I walked in, when I walked in, I did not say a word. One of them said, the preachers walked in. I heard him mumbling. There's that obnoxious cooing like doves. And I heard him say, the preacher walked in. Don't anybody curse. Well, they said really swear, which is a British term. And he said, everybody, get rid of anything that's not good. I didn't have to say a word. And sometimes we can silently have a great effect upon others. Do you believe that? You know, the night Jesus stood up and girded himself with a towel. He did so without other, uttering a word until it was time to utter it. 
but he made an impact on that gathering of disciples that would be heard forever around the world in every nation where men and women and young people obey the Lord and follow the Lord. In Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 43 then the righteous, well, who are the righteous? Well, look at the first part of the word, key, key off of it. He says, then the righteous, those that are right with God, they walk in the light as he's in the light. They have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, 1 John 1 and 7, just keeps on cleansing them of their sins. You know, we stay right with God if we walk in the light and we have that fellowship we should with other saints. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Are you listening? Jesus said, we that are right with God can shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the father. You know, I don't look at that as just a responsibility. Now, I know it's a responsibility. I know that. I know that I have a responsibility to glorify my Father. But I also like to think about it, Christ. I like to think about what a privilege I have. Think about it that way. That God, through the gospel, has chosen me to shine as a light to dispel the darkness that is around me. We can do that in the Lord's church. Whether we're in congregation at Palm Beach Lakes, whether we're in the, in the Lord's Church, Jonathan and in Atlanta, Georgia, or whether we're halfway around the world in the Pacific Islands, or far away, or as close rather, as the Caribbean Islands. It doesn't matter where we come from. We can shine as lights. But you know what? You know what? The choice is mine, isn't it? Do not think that I always walk into a group without speaking. Someone, Jonathan, that's right. Jonathan said, yeah, I don't never imagine you walking into a group. In this same group, it later came up and said, Robert, what can we do in this country to change this country? They shouldn't have asked. I mean, I started and I went for about an hour and a half. Each one of them, one by one, began to coo like an obnoxious pigeon. And it went even beyond that, and they each one started to fall off the side of their chairs. And every time they did, I'd say, are you listening? And they'd come to attention again. You know, we must stand for what is right. We must shine as lights in the world that we live in. I'm trying to change it, fellas, and it's got mad at me. Fellas, can you give me a, a forward on this? Thank you. We may go all together off on this, and it will not bother me. I might have hit the bottom. I don't know what I did. Oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. I didn't hit it hard enough. I don't put a little pressure on it. All right. Number four, the fourth way that we may be able to to really work out our own salvation. Remember, Paul's writing this letter to those that are children of God, those that are Christians. And he will say, you need to hold fast the word of life. You need to hold it fast. Now, let's look at some passages that talk about that. Philippians 2.16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of the Lord. Important? Yes. That I am not run, run in vain or labored in vain. You know, wouldn't you hate to come down to the last five years of your life, or the last two years of your life, and the last year of your life, and you shipwrecked your faith? You think about it. You've been in the church five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and you come down to the last year, and you shipwreck your faith. We need to hold fast. We need to hold fast to hold it, to retain it. We, we need to just hold on to the Word of God, just like, just like we're holding on to the thing that we would love the most in our life. 
In Proverbs 23 and, and 23, Solomon would say, buy the truth and do not sell it. Now, he didn't say don't share it. He said, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Brethren, we need to take God's truth and we need to hold on to it like we would hold on to God's unchanging hand. In Titus 1 and verse 9, Paul would say, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, convict those who are contradict. See, we need to hold on to God's word. We not only need to hold on to it, but we need to be faithful to it, we need to be true to it, and we need to proclaim it to others. You know, to hold on in this text means more than just Holding on to it. It means to hold on to it and hold it forth to others. We have a resp responsibility to hold on to it and hold it forth to others. In 1 Timothy 4 and 16, Paul again would say, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you'll save both yourself and those that hear ye, here's the reward. If we hold on to the word of God and hold it faithfully before others, the reward is that we will save ourselves and all those that will hear us. Let me thank you this morning for giving God's word your undivided attention. You know, this is an important lesson of how that you and I can be responsible to God and what a privilege it is. Question is, are you working out your own salvation? And if you're not, will you not start doing so this very day? I walk away with a deeper conviction after looking at God's Word on this that I may work out my own salvation and be faithful and true to Him. And may God help us all to do just that. Thank you very much.